thank you very much, for, uh, Professor Nick Benoda. It's good to be with you again. Uh, Nick, when I was sitting down there, I almost walked out of this room because I thought I was being attacked. I told that I bought very tall trains uh, <laughs> that uh, were involved in uh, craft to finance, political parties, and so on. But I was persuaded by my comrade to stay. Now, thank you very much, comrades uh, Auta and uh, uh, the, the uh, Save South Africa and the Na Ahmed Katrada Foundation uh, uh, for inviting us. Uh, it's the first time that people call me a hero. Uh, I'm not used to that. <coughs> We, we have been called fakes uh, of stalwarts and veterans. Uh, people call us fakes. Let me briefly talk about PRASA. It's important that we understand the importance of an organization called PRASA. It's an organization whose mandate is to provide essential commuter transportation for millions of South African workers and people traveling long distances to the rural areas. Equally to provide bus service in a similar manner. It is an organization that has been allocated a budget of 172 billion rand over 20 years. If I mention this number, you would understand why there is so much struggle to control, to get into PRASA and to control it. It is a very critical organization in terms of driving the process of industrialization, economic growth, economic development, investment as a key state entity that would then create traction for other state uh, private companies to come into this country and invest. It is critical for the creation of small businesses in this country through supplier components, etc. Because in do, uh, discharging the program of modernization of PRASA, which is what it is busy with now, to modernize commuter rail transportation by uh, getting state-of-the-art trains, investing extensively in modern signaling infrastructure to ensure that uh, there is proper communication between the trains, train controllers, as well as the, the, the centers, various centers of communication. Uh, and we've got three big ones in this connection. There's one led by a company called Siemens. We call it the Gauden Nerve Center, and it is in Carlfontein. Uh, that project has been completed. There's one that is run by Bombardier with their black partners in KwaZulu-Natal. The third one, and please don't talk about the arms deal, the third one is run by a new company called, uh, another company called Thales Mazia. It's a rollout of infrastructure in preparation for the new trains. And Praza has begun procuring 600 new trains. 20 of them comes from Brazil and 600 of them would be manufactured here in South Africa because we believe we have to create jobs here. We've got to make sure, we've got to make sure that we use that factory to create economies of scale, ensuring that through the localization system that the components for the trains and everything that you do could be supplied by local companies. And that factory is being built in Niger. There's a lot of progress achieved so far in respect of uh, that program. The 18 of the first 20 trains have already arrived in South Africa. You would have seen the president launching them recently. Of course, the new minister decided that I should not be there as the chairman of PRASA. 
He wanted the glory for himself, uh, uh, not for the port of Prasa. So that's the job we are doing. Now, as part of the modernization program, Prasa went out to procure, initially they wanted to procure 88 locomotives. Uh, the diesel ones, as well as the hybrids. Uh, to pull the existing trains, which are already very old, and we have to continue maintaining them. A tender went out with very clear specs. The response was given to that tender using a model called Euro 3000, which was complying in all respects with the commuter rail network system of Transnet as well as the rail safety uh, regulator requirements. The company that submitted, there were a number of companies that su submitted, including uh, BITS, included uh, General Electric, and, and so on. But one of them was an unknown entity called Sifambo. Sifambo means transport. I'm sure uh, Prince Marshall would know it better. This company had never been in any rail business at all. It was required to demonstrate experience in that regard, skills, financial capacity to carry out a program of that much a project of that magnitude. It, it was bought as a shelf company and it became a financial services and it found its way into being the winner of the bid of Prasa. No engineering capacity, it didn't even have a contract with a subcontractor. When finally, the, the, and, and by the way, the tender required that it be a lease of these trains. But when they submitted their bid, they also submitted the bid to sell the locomotives, not trains, locomotives to Prasa. The supplier of these locomotives is a company called Voslo, based in Spain. It became a partner with Sifambo, but the contract was only signed after Sifambo was allocated the contract. The subcontracting arrangement between the two was only after the contract was submitted, uh, was, was uh, signed with Sifambo. Sifambo was also required to provide a, a performance bond of 10% of the cost of the locomotives. When the purchase occurred, Voslo told Prasa, look, you actually don't need Euro 3000, man. we can give you something better, buy Euro 4000, which then was christened to Afro 4000. This is where the problem started, because Euro 4000 was very tall, it didn't comply with the specs of safety here in South Africa and proper spec with the regard to rail network. But they went ahead and bought it. By that time, what started as a requirement of 88 locomotives had gone down to 70 locomotives because they had not factored in the impact of foreign currency exchange. They tried to cover up for that, and of course, the amount was 3.5 3 billion rand. But with the escalation of the euro against the rand, by the time we decided to stop it, it was already sitting at about 5,000, uh, 5, 5 billion rather. It was already sitting at 5 billion for the country. That's one aspect of it. But there was Another company, I'm going to come back to these matters, another company called Siangena. I'm still, I'm still surprised that it doesn't feature as part of the state capture. 
because that company's bosses have captured literally a significant portion of the management of Prasa and they get any contract they want. Uh, they did what they called speed gates, uh, uh, monitors and cameras, and they were supposed to do automated ticketing system to facilitate speedy movement of people at the, sta at the, at the, at the stations and revenue collection for the, for the company. And that contract started off as a contract of 1.9 billion rand. It was speedily done just before the 2010 World Cup because they said, well, we need this quickly. The world is coming here. We must do it quickly. And it was for a few stations. After that, without proper procurement process, they then extended it by another four, 2 billion rand and it went to 4 billion. So you already deal between the two with 7.5 billion rands, with the escalations, of course, that are attendant uh, to that. It would be anything that only the future would have known. I was appointed to Praza on the 1st of uh, August, 2014. I was asked by the minister, the poor Peters, if I would be willing to be the chairman, and I said, well, if you ask me and your cabinet agrees, it's okay. I did not have a mandate that said, when you find corruption there, don't fight it. And when we instruct you to allow for money of the state entity to be channeled to certain individuals, please agree. I was not given that mandate because I would not have accepted that appointment. So when I got in there, I started realizing that things were not going well. I thought the CEO had just enormous powers. And I said to him, you are, a, you are a nice young man, very intelligent, but I think you make many mistakes. And it is so because you seem to have worked with people who never showed you your errors when you committed errors. I want you and I to work differently now going forward. I don't want to dig into the past. I want us to work differently. I did not know about all these problems of the uh, Srifambo and the train, the, the, the signaling systems, the speed gates and so on. I didn't know anything. Then one evening in November, I see on TV that the public protector is making a statement that she's investigating Prasa. We had never been told by anybody. I then demanded to see the interim report of the public protest. I could not get it until only in March 2015. In July of the same year, the Auditor General also released a, a damning report on the organization about a whole range of things, including the locomotives. We decided to cooperate with the public protector to make sure that further investigation take place into this organization. <clears throat> and when the derailed report came out of the public protector on the 15th of August, 2015, we immediately said we were going to cooperate. We're going to implement the remedial actions recommended by the public protector. We, we, we didn't do what you, you did in Parliament about Uganda. <laughs> Is he saying I'm too long? <laughs> but, he, but he's saying it very nicely. <laughs> so, two more minutes. So that's the picture, but there are many more things that I would have said. I, I wish we had more time, but we don't have it. <clears throat> but the long and short of it, we understood our mandate to being that one of protecting the interests of the commuters whose purpose we're supposed to serve and protect the taxpayers' money. And that's why we went ahead with these investigations. 
Throughout, we were harassed by members of parliament about the investigations. They said, no, why do you do it? Why don't you leave it to the special investigating unit, a captured entity? Why don't you use other things? Uh, why do you appoint a private company to investigate? So we are harassed throughout. We are told that we are spending too much time and too much money. As you recall, the minister at one point said we must stop it, and I refused. I said it's not going to stop because we've got fiduciary duties as well uh, to make sure that we protect the interests of the company and the interests of the taxpayer. We are at the point at which now we have two major cases in court. Uh, well, one has already been won. Uh, it's the one of the locomotives. That contract has been cancelled. But by the time it got cancelled, <laughs> by the time it got cancelled, already 2.6 billion rand had been paid. We, we have sent a letter of demand to Sifambo. Sifambo is saying it doesn't have money, it's liquidating itself. But we know Sifambo was set up as a front for the Spanish. So we'll get our money from the Spanish. They will have to pay. <laughs> the Siangena matter, there have been lots of interference with that as well. Um, the judge gave a ruling in terms of the uh, promotion of Administrative Justice Act, which requires that you, you, you launch your complaint within 180 days after the contract was signed. I could not have done so because I was not there when the contract was signed. By the time we got the facts, the 180 days had already passed, which means, therefore, that if we follow that route, thieves can steal. If they are able to hide for 180 days, nothing should happen to them. So we are appealing that judgment. He dismissed our appeal, but we are now petitioning uh, the High Court, the, the Court of Appeal, to reverse his judgment. So that's where we are at the moment with regard to process. But we placed before the law enforcement agencies about 41 complaints. We gave to them forensic capacity to make sure they, that they can analyze movements of funds, analyze the Section 205 subpoenas, which allow them to go into the accounts of every one of those companies and the individuals. They've done nothing about it. That is why you hear today that I'm taking them to court, because I said, I need the court now to force them. They must explain to the courts and the South African public why, as a state organ, they are refusing to discharge their mandate. Where are we? They said they are, they're going to oppose our application. Now, we have been having a huge battle. The new minister has come. When they failed to remove us, as you know, they tried to remove us and went to court to set aside the decision of the minister. They adopted a new tactic to isolate me because I'm a problem. I'm the problem. They called directors, some directors, one by one to say, please resign so that this guy remains alone. And when he's alone, there'll be no board. He will not be able to make decisions. Now we are at a point at which there's four of us who are independent directors. There's supposed to be a nominee of National Treasury and a nominee of the Department of Transport. The ministries have held those individuals back so that the board, which requires six persons to correct, does not have a quorum. So that's where we are. Uh, yeah, but I think it's important part. <laughs> Very important. One moment. Now, now, I see Minister Maluzi Giga was speaking at Stock Exchange saying, I want effective and efficient uh, state entities. I want good corporate governance. He is withholding a nominee who should be on the board of Prasa to do his work at a critical time when that board, that board is supposed to finalize the annual audit. It can't because it is, it is not a, 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 a correct board. It doesn't have a quorum. It can't complete its work. Now, last week, what do we get? The state attorney comes and he says, no, 
we will not file our papers to oppose you because it has come to our attention that that board does not have a quorum. So the chairman of the board does not have the authority to compel us to investigate uh, the matters that he placed before us. This is what the state capture does uh, to this country. Everybody is quiet. I've written to the president of this country. I've written to the minister, two ministers of transport. I've written to national treasury. I've written to the auditor general to say, we've got a legal duty to discharge our, our mandate as a board of directors. Please appoint the two directors to this board so that we can do our job. Because he's using the excuse that the rest he needs to advertise, it's going to take a long time, it has to go to the cabinet, the cabinet must approve. So, in effect, therefore, there is a collusion between the executive authority and those who are stealing from the taxpayer and the organs of state that we should fail in discharging our fiduciary duties. So that's where we are. And I think it is proper, therefore, that all of us fight to the hilt to end this corruption. Thank you. Thank you, Papa.